Once saved, received Jesus into their heart by praying the sinner's prayer, always saved? Or is it possible to lose one's salvation for any reason? Mm-hmm. Well, I would say it's not possible to lose salvation as though you do something and then it's taken away from you. Or you, again, you just, it sort of leaves you. I, I do think you can turn your back on on salvation, though. Part of the problem is is really, and I'm not accusing Chris in Australia of this, but part of the problem, if you think about the way the question is worded, receiving Jesus into their heart by praying the sinner's prayer. You know, the, the idea of, of receiving Jesus into your heart, it's really not New Testament language. It's just the way we sort of express the idea of salvation. But we, we've kind of turned salvation and conversion, the biblical theology of salvation and conversion, into an incantation, uh, into a... into into a prayer, you know, use the right words and then the magic works, you know, you're, you're sort of in. Uh, my, my position, I, I think I could boil down to this statement. If you believe, if you believe, you know, if you embrace the gospel, if you trust the gospel, if you believe, you are eternally secure. If you don't, you're not. So if you believe, you are eternally secure. If you don't believe, you are not eternally secure. What I mean by that is you have to maintain your faith. And I, and I don't, I'm not talking about works in any way. I think, you know, people have heard me enough now in this podcast and other contexts. Uh, I understand what the gospel is. It has nothing to do with human merit. Zero, nada, zilch. Okay, but you have to maintain your faith. In other words, you have to believe. So just like in the Old Testament, you couldn't have a believer like Abraham or David claim election or claim a covenant relationship and then go off and worship Baal. So now you can't just abandon your faith to choose another God or no God at all and still claim that you're part of the family of God. I mean, in the Old Testament, we had, again, this takes us into the whole context of election, which in the Old Testament, I think is fundamentally misunderstood. Election in the Old Testament is not about salvation. Okay, It can't be by definition because lots and lots and lots of elect Israelites went off and became apostates and worshiped Baal and other gods. That's why we had the exile. We do not have Baal worshipers in heaven. Okay, Baal worshipers are not part of the family of God. Election was not about salvation. It was about a status whereby you received the truth about the true God, then you had to believe it. Okay, that, that, that's what election is. You know, you, election puts you in a, in a unique position among all the nations to receive the truth about the true God, but you still have to believe it. And lots of Israelites didn't. So they, yes, they, they, had, they, they had elect status, they had the covenants, and then they went off and worshiped Baal. Sorry, but the Old Testament is quite clear that you will be rejected. You, you do not worship another God. And it's the same thing in, in the New Testament. But the problem is, again, we've turned the doctrine of salvation into an incantation. You can't lose it through any sin for a a simple reason. That which could not be gained by moral perfection can't be lost by moral imperfection. The issue is believing. You must believe, okay? And we all know that believers, you know, those who profess to believe anyway, uh, turn out to really really not believe. They, they, they abandon their faith. They forsake their faith in, in the God of Israel and Jesus, and they go off and they worship something else. They adopt another faith, or they, they don't have any faith at all. Again, the fact that they prayed a prayer, they said certain words at one point in their life, doesn't really mean a whole lot. Uh, it, it's a profession that they made. But the question is, do you believe or don't you? If you believe, you are eternally secure. If you don't, you are not eternally secure. So uh, let, let me just, uh, there are other reasons why I think this way. If, if you go to Matthew 10, okay, if you go to Matthew 10, let me just uh, go there now to, to sort of set this up. But again, there's just things that are sort of obvious that we kind of miss. Matthew 10 begins this way. And he, Jesus, called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, heal every disease and every affliction, so on and so forth. Then the names of the apostles were, we get the grocery list. Verse five, the 12 Jesus sent out instructing them. And then beginning in verse five, when he sends them out, we get a, we get a long sort of rehearsal of various things Jesus instructed them about what's going on here. What do you do? You know, when, when you go out here and, and you be my disciple and here's verse, you go all the way to verses 32 and 33. Listen to what Jesus said. He says this to the 12 disciples, verse 32. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my father who is in heaven, but whoever denies me before men, 
I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Now, I'd say, he's saying this to the disciples, I would say that the disciples, again, were, were believers, but he's treating it seriously, saying, if you deny me, if you leave the faith, if you turn to another God or another or no God at all, the Father is not going to say, hey, good to see you, glad to see you, you prayed a prayer, you said the right words at some point in your life. The question is, do you believe or don't you? Not, did you use, again, an incantation at some point in your life? And again, he's saying this to the disciples. It, it, it's kind of shocking, but, but there it is. Now, probably at this point, there are going to be people in the audience who are thinking of language like, you know, when Paul talks about being sealed with the Holy Spirit under the day of redemption. Uh, again, that, that idea means that the Spirit, the presence of the Spirit indwelling believers, is the validation or evidence of, of salvation. It doesn't mean that you no longer have to believe, okay? It, it doesn't mean that continued faith is now optional. Sealing means you were marked by the Spirit. You bear the name. Again, you are, you are aligning yourself with, with the gospel, with Jesus. Again, think about what Paul says in other places. Okay, Paul's the same guy who wrote about the sealing of the Spirit. And I'm saying, look, the sealing of the Spirit language doesn't give you permission to not believe anymore. Okay, one, you're, you're sealed, you're in. doesn't really matter if you go off and worship another. Yes, it does matter if you, if you abandon the gospel. Okay, you must believe. If you believe, you're eternally secure. If you don't, you're not. doesn't have anything to do with works. doesn't have anything to do with whether you sin or not. We all do. John says, if you, don't, if you say you're not a sinner, you're a liar. I mean, all this stuff, it has nothing to do with works and merit. It has everything to do with what you believe, what your faith is in. Romans 11. Okay, here's another one. Paul is writing to Christians, okay, Christians in Rome. And he's talking about Israel and Israel and the church, this back and forth in Romans 9 to 11. Well, here's Romans 11, 20 to 23. He says, Israel was broken off. The Israelites were broken off because of their unbelief. But you, again, you Christians here in Rome, stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. In other words, if God forsook Israelites who went off and apostatized, you're going to get the same treatment. Verse 22, note then the kindness and severity. You got polar opposites here, the kindness and severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, they'll be grafted back in. For God has the power to graft them in again. I mean, I don't know how much clearer Paul could be here. He's telling Christians, look, you can look at those Jews over there, and oh, they're the outsiders now, and the, and the, the Christians, now we're the ones who are the family, we're the people of God now. And Paul's saying, look, don't get proud. Fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. You must continue to believe. This is why Paul and other New Testament writers constantly talk about remaining steadfast in the faith. Okay, Colossians 1.23. Again, I, I, need, I think I need to belabor this a little bit because, again, what I'm saying might, you know, be controversial to, to what, especially in an evangelical context, what people have heard. But there's a reason this other stuff is in the New Testament. Paul says in Colossians 1.23, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Again, verse 22, you're reconciled if you indeed continue in the faith, so on and so forth. Paul expects believers to continue because the, the Spirit is there to help them. But he also, again, knows because he wrote, he's the same guy who wrote Romans 11, says, if you don't continue in your faith, what happened to the Israelites will happen to you. He, now, you know, look at what Colossians 1.23 doesn't say. I mean, it, Paul's saying, look, it doesn't say that you're eternally secure if you professed Christ or you prayed a prayer uh, and then you, 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 you turn away. It says you're eternally secure if you believe the gospel, if you remain steadfast in that belief and you don't turn away. But Paul doesn't, you know, he doesn't, it, he doesn't say, well, you're, you're okay if you don't sin or you're okay if you don't struggle with the flesh. You're okay, you know, if you're perfect. That has nothing to do with it. It's always about 
continuing in your faith. Salvation never depends on your performance, ever. Again, what you couldn't gain by moral perfection, you can't lose by moral imperfection. It's about believing loyalty. And that is true across the Testaments. I spend some time in the unseen realm talking about this. It's the same thing in the new. Now, I should add a few thoughts here. I don't think, for instance, other other verses are going to pop into people's heads. I think Paul had every expectation the Spirit would bring believers to the end of the journey. Philippians 2, he that has began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, okay? If you make it to the end, the Spirit had a role in that. The Spirit carried you through, okay? But that verse does not give you license to no longer believe, is is what I'm saying. Uh, Hebrews 6, I don't, I personally don't think Hebrews 6 teaches that if believers do lapse into unbelief, then they can never return. I don't believe that at all. I think that's a misreading of the passage. Uh, if you go back and, and look at Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, it says this. Uh, the writer says, It is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. I would say there's nothing in the passage that indicates God would refuse a repentant believer who had lapsed. Because while we were yet sinners, while we were hostile to God, Paul says elsewhere, God accepted us. He accepted our faith. God wants sinners to believe. John 3.16 doesn't say whoever believes except the ones who once did and then didn't might have everlasting life. No, whoever believes, God is going to embrace. Now, the impossibility I think referred to in Hebrews 6 refers to the finality of the work of Jesus on the cross. In other words, that's the only means of salvation for sinners. There is no plan B. The point of the language of Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 is simply that there is nothing more that God can do to secure salvation for lost sinners. It is impossible to add anything to what Jesus did on the cross. When Jesus said it was finished, he meant it. To add something else to salvation, some plan B, again, would be to put what Jesus did on the cross to an open shame. So Hebrews 6 isn't saying it's impossible for someone who lapses to come back to belief. It is possible, and God will accept them. What it's saying, it's telling us that those who turn their back on the gospel, they don't have any other hope. There is nothing else that can bring about salvation. The unbeliever must believe in the thing they currently don't believe in. There is no other way. God has nothing else to offer except what happened at the cross. And so we're back to what I said at the beginning. If you believe, you are eternally secure. If you don't believe, you're not. The issue is, do you believe or not? And we all know people at various stages of the journey. You know, they made a profession before. Now they're off being an atheist or they're off doing this or that or don't. Don't try to parse their experience. The answer is the same whether, you know, you think they were saved or not or not really saved before. Or whatever. The answer is the same. The answer is believe the gospel. I mean, to, to people no matter where they're at, people who've never heard it, people who've heard it, once believed it, and now they've, they've turned their back on it. The solution is the same. It's identical. Believe the gospel. If you believe, okay, you will be eternally secure. You will be with the Lord. If you don't, if you turn away from it, you won't be. And and this isn't this isn't never having a doubt. This is an act of turning to another God or turning to no God at all. This is an act of the will I'm talking about. I'm not talking about ever having a doubt flash through your mind. Okay, everybody has that. What I'm talking about is a decision to turn away voluntarily to worship another God. We do not have Baal worshipers in heaven, and we do not have people who don't believe in the gospel in heaven. We don't have people who reject the gospel in heaven is probably a better way to say it. 